The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. You can't operate in this world without purpose. All of us have purpose, but if you don't think you have a purpose, that's been given to you. If you don't know what purpose you're supposed to fulfill, life becomes very mundane, repetitious, without a point. And then you begin to wander. You're not here to wander around. You're purposed, highly purposed. Satan has come to scramble that message in the hopes that you will not reach far enough to discover why you're here, why you exist, that possibly you'll adopt something somebody else said, right? Have you noticed when other people come up with these purposes, it may last a month or two, but then the momentum dies. And when it dies, you're back in depression again. There's no need to hide that here in this place. This place is about being who you are. All of us have dealt with depression, right? There are no Mr. or Mrs. Goody Two Shoes here. We're all sinners saved by faith in fellowship collectively, right? We're learning. We're growing. We're about to graduate or to be born. We're not here to, you know, play games, not with the word of God. But in that same breath, God knows exactly who we are. We're not here to start some cult, some procedural based place where people have to come in and shake their right arm and bend their head low and bring it back up again and say three words and then sit down. None of that stuff. No, no. This is about freedom of the Spirit, operating in freedom of the Spirit for people to actually find a place of freedom in Christ. And as you grow, so can you do, hopefully without restriction. We're not putting those restrictions, not in this place. Anybody who feels, uh, you know, that's a spirit that I don't do well with. I don't do with that spirit where it suppresses the heart and procedures start to lead. Or a person is frightened to ask a question because everybody else may scoff. Or they're afraid to say something because somebody else within bounds, we know, we all know how to say something, right? We don't use those little games like, well, this is freedom of speech. Don't leave that stuff in the world. Everybody knows exactly where righteousness is and where darkness is but when you're operating in that freedom when you have a problem your language is not going to be right all the time you don't have to act like everything is all good when it's not you don't have to smile when you're ready to cry this is about healing about repair not about acting leave the acting in hollywood outside this is about truth if somebody does not feel like smiling let's find out why let's discover what we can do to help that person out let's leave no one behind how about that? Instead of all this fake stuff, because I'm telling you in the world, that's what they practice. They're doing it right now so much so they believe that fake stuff. And now that they believe it, they have no solution to tamper it down, to get rid of it. They're trying to think up brand new policies to, to help out one of the policies they passed previously that somehow people took advantage of and they didn't find. So they have to make some more, tack on a bunch of amendments. By the way, everybody's doing that because everybody's emulating the corporate world. This place is not going to emulate the corporate world unless the Lord established it. So let me tell you this. In the book of Daniel, it says, He shall come up and become strong with a small people. And let me tell you what bothers me. Every time I see a small country doing the impossible, they catch my eye. Because the Bible says, He shall come up from a small people. He's going to impress the world. He's going to travel up on the fattest places of the province. So it's not coming up from some huge country. It's not going to be some superpower. You know what that does? That cancels out all superpowers. You have to go back to a small people. They come up from a small people. They begin to travel all over the place. They do what their fathers have not done. They scatter among them the prey, the spoils, and the riches. They begin to talk to Israel, first by policy, but then they have something against Israel. The beast has this one thorn in its side. It hates the covenant that's in Israel. It hates the holy covenant. So you can understand that. So it's coming up from a small person and they hate the covenant with Israel. Most countries are not concerned about the covenant in Israel. There are only a few qualifications of people who would have an issue with the covenant in Israel. Listen to how it gets big. Because he has an issue with the covenant in Israel. By policies, by policies, they start talking about it. And this guy actively tries, listen to me, this guy actively tries to terminate or to dissolve the covenant Israel operates by. And then he does the ultimate. In the Bible it says, he'll be in league with those who have indignation against the holy covenant. He'll go out and have information or intelligence with them who also have indignation against 
the Holy Covenant and them collectively. At that point, you're looking at more than one nation. Them, they collectively, this collective group of people will go into Jerusalem and take it and they will place the abomination that maketh desolate. And of course, we know what it states in the New Testament. When, when people see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, right? We know, we all know that. But my point is, this guy comes up from a small people. He is appointed not because he's elected. He is appointed by proxy. In other words, he's appointed through the fall of the one before him. He comes into power by way of death. See how that works? Daniel is such a beautiful blueprint of these things, but because he comes up from a small people, it's almost like that's disregarded. It can't be disregarded. And he has indignation against the Holy Covenant. Indignation is a hatred that you have inside. And for a human being or some dark force, that's awful. Right? That means if it's in your heart, it's not something you just read about. You don't read about something and all of a sudden you have indignation. You have to be intimate with something to have indignation. Understand that word. Indignation is not a normal word. It's not some usual word. In order to have indignation, you must have understanding. You must have intimacy with the subject. And then and only then can you have indignation. That comes by way of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge about that subject. You have to be intimate with that subject. You have to really know about it. In other words, if you really know about a subject, about the Holy Covenant, what does that mean? What does it mean when you're intimate with the Holy Covenant? but you stand against it. That means you're in opposition to what the religion teaches. And it also means that you follow a different belief. You follow a different belief. Under a similar banner, you follow a different belief. So it really lets me know that this thing is not so external as you think. Now remember, first we're, we talked about the guy. We're talking about the guy before whom three kings fell. What does that mean? If three kings fall before him, then he absorbs three nations. Those are provinces. That's what those are. Those three horns that fell before him. Horns rule provinces. So if three horns fell before him, he takes over those provinces. See how that works? While people look at the big people, right? That you can hear them every day, right? You can hear them every day pointing out people. Well, they come from the wrong nation, number one. This guy comes from an insignificant place. It's insignificant at first, then it grows and it meets just about everybody in the province, and it prospers and becomes rich. I mean, very rich. It becomes so rich to the point where it has leverage over the other nations to cause them to bend. All the while, this thing is increasing what it believes in with silver and gold, which means because this guy, now listen to me, it says he magnifies this thing. Remember, remember in Revelation it said, he told the world to make an image to the first beast. That's what the second beast said. Make an image to the first beast. What is the first beast? Well, if he said make an image to the first beast, then there are two beasts. Number one, and that word beast is used specifically by the living God and in prophecy. Why? Because whatever God makes, he has it named. If he makes an animal in the field, he names it. But a beast, a beast that has something continued to call a beast has no name. It has no designation. It is self-made. In Revelation, you'll note two beasts. You'll notice one of the beasts has seven heads. Anybody know what the seven heads are? One of the heads were, as it were, wounded to death. And upon those heads, their horns and their crowns upon those horns. Later on in Revelation, if you ever read Revelation from start to finish, Revelation tells you exactly what those heads are of the beast. It tells you exactly what the horns are, and it tells you exactly what the crowns are. It also tells you that those ten kings, which are the ten, right? Because a horn, listen, listen, a head is a nation or province. The Bible specifically says that the seven heads of the beast are the seven hills that surround Jerusalem. Well, what did God say, Matthew? Armies in, are encamped about Jerusalem. But I'll give you something else interesting. The seven hills, that word hill is very important. Do you know what a hill is? It's a place of power. That's why you have Mount Zion. Sanctuary of strength is Mount Zion. What is that? That's a place of power for God's people in Israel, Jerusalem. You see that? This to me now. That nation, that, that place is a place of power. And it has an appointed, that appointed person over that power or position would be that horn. That's a position. What does it mean? A position can be held by multiple people. How do we know this? Because in the book of Daniel, this place of position that the beast actually held was held by three before him. But they all fell. 
Did you ever see that? How else do we know this? Because in Revelation, when it talks about Mystery Babylon, it says there was a woman that sat atop the beast, and on her forehead was written, Mystery Babylon, Great Mother of Harlots. On her forehead was written, Mystery Babylon, Great Mother of Harlots. And then it says, he gives you a description of the beast that she rode and how it hates her. It can't stand her. So I'll tell you something. If the beast, that beast being the same one that I spoke about, which was endowed with the powers and strength of the dragon, because in the Bible it says, and the dragon, talking about the beast, gave him his power, strength, and great authority. Right? Satan gives all of what he has to the beast, the earthly beast. It even tells us where the beast came out of. It came out of the sea. Then in Revelation 17, it says, The sea are the many peoples and tongues and nations of the earth. So it came out of the people. So we know that the first beast of Revelation is a bunch of people. Well, what do you call a bunch of people of many different languages and many different tongues and all this and the other? You call those nations. And when you get nations together, you have something like the UN, the EAU, right? You have places like that. The, a consolidation of nations, which, by the way, some, some of these representations of these consolidation of nations is a fairly new idea. And if you look at the news carefully, you're going to start hearing a keyword, international order. Why? Because they're very careful about the rhetoric. And you're going to start hearing that word, international order, how the international order cannot be disturbed. And that anybody who falls, who, who is on the outside of that international order, how they're going to face the wrath of the whole system. So they cannot fall outside of that international order. You ever hear that proclamation deemed against a nation, they're going to take that nation away from that individual. That's a fact. They'll use that word, but if they ever deem someone as an enemy of the international order, that place, whoever they point it to, is going to have a problem. 1,000% guaranteed. Anyway, that's a fairly new concept. And with these international orders, you have specific people appointed to each nation. That position of appointment becomes one of the horns. The person who is selected to be a spokesman for that position will be the crown. A crown represents an active, active leadership is what that crown represents. Active leadership. And of course, in Revelation, it tells you that the 10 kings which you saw have received no kingdom as of yet, but will one hour with the beast. It'll really mess you up because God has put it in their hearts. Listen to me carefully, because you're a Christian, you're a believer, right? So you're not just anybody out there. God put it in their hearts. Whose hearts? The hearts of those 10 kings to do what? To give their power to the beast one hour. So who initiated that? God the Father, not the devil. Do you see that? The devil did not initiate the timing of the beast. God the Father did. He put it in the hearts of those 10 kings to give their power over to the beast one hour to accomplish the indignation, God's indignation, which is what? Not spoken about in the book of Jeremiah. Only one hour. He put that in the hearts, the heart of the beast, the 10 kings. God did something to the heart so they would give their power over to the beast one hour that the beast could rule the whole thing and do what? Set up the abomination of desolation. God did that. That's why the woman is freely riding atop the beast at first, but the beast hates her and will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. You know what that's a representation of? See, we're going to look soberly at this so you're not shocked and surprised when it happens. A lot of times people can't see this. Listen, I, when you have grown in this world and you've been exposed to people, you learn things in a specific way and sometimes it's very difficult to break. God's aware of that, which is why God's word becomes an anchor for people like me. I didn't learn under anybody, right? So I'm the one that's least qualified of them all as far as men's teachings concerning that subject. I sat under no one. So you could basically say, I'm not qualified to carry on that tradition. Honestly, I'm not. But what I can do is read with innocent eyes. Now, it's not to say I'm reading with correct eyes, but I do follow my spiritual convictions. And guess what? When you follow a spiritual conviction, if you're wrong, well, then you're wrong. But you're going to follow that conviction. So it's not something I dreamed up. In fact, I don't even agree with it internally. I don't want that to be true, but that's the way it's written. So it's not up to me. And when you follow conviction, spiritual convictions like that, no matter what you like or don't like, there are some things in Revelation I don't like. I just don't like. I would like to believe it another way, but I cannot. I'm telling you that right now. So I'm going to read you something. Somebody said, why don't you call yourself unqualified by men? Notice that one. I'm a rogue. Throughout my entire career, I've been a rogue. You know why? Because I don't believe that men can call 
what God has appointed. I don't believe that. If God appoints a frog to be over something, then that frog is going to be over something. If God appoints a mule to be over something, then that mule is going to be over something. It does not need man's approval to be over anything. If God appoints, he appoints. Man did not approve of me being born. Did you know that? Man did not approve of you being born, but you were born. That's how I believe. You guys tell I have something against the flesh? Yes, my own flesh. See, I know my own flesh very well, so I'll never be a friend of flesh because I know my own flesh. I told you guys before I'm the worst person I ever met. I'm very intimate with myself. I know myself very well. I can't stand the flesh. Let me read this to you guys. This is Revelation 17. I want you guys to follow this just one time so you can get this in your spirit. You ready? I'm going to start at verse 5. In the name of most mystery Babylon, great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Please follow me. And an angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast, this is verse 8 of Revelation 17, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, go into perdition. That means go into doom. Its path is doom, death, right? Go with them to perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not yet is. Let me read that whole thing to you one more time. I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. And the beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, shall go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Immediately, here is the mind which hath wisdom. What mind has wisdom? The mind of Christ. Thank you, Lord. So that means in the New Testament, Jesus spoke about this. Yes, he did. The mind that has wisdom is the mind of Christ because we seek wisdom from above, correct? So then the mind of wisdom is the mind of Christ. If we use our own minds, the Bible calls that the carnal mind. He didn't say, here is the carnal mind. No, it said the mind of wisdom. So it is, it is pointing us back to Jesus of Nazareth, who described this. He described the seven heads, the seven mountains. He described it. Let me continue. Verse 10, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, one exists. Listen, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. So five are already gone. One is in existence, and the other is not yet come. That was also spoken about in the book of Daniel, about the kingdoms of the earth. You know how many kingdoms? You know the count of kingdoms that were in the earth? Anybody? You'll find this in our studies in the book of Enoch. You'll find this in the Old Testament studies also, right? You know, we're not counting like American, England, and no, 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 no. See, because let me set you straight on something. King Nebuchadnezzar saw a statue, and that statue was constructed out of the kingdoms that will be on the earth. And King Nebuchadnezzar was the standard of all the kingdoms, which was the head of gold. And all the kingdoms that will come after King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom would be inferior to his. But there were only four portions, four kingdoms, four kingdoms. Now, one of those kingdoms had three kingdoms in it. My goodness, the Bible is awesome. See, because that threw you off, didn't it? When Daniel speaks of four kingdoms, just four, then he broke down the statue. Within the statue, you see the progression of kingdoms. And the word kingdom that was utilized in the book of Daniel referred to the world, the rule of the world. In the rule of the world, you had subsets. And God gave King Nebuchadnezzar authority over wherever the animals would walk, fish would swim, and the birds would fly. God the Father gave King Nebuchadnezzar, that tyrant, King Nebuchadnezzar, rule of everything. See, that was a problem in Jeremiah. When God exiled his people, he exiled them to save them. Why? He sent them right to Babylon, the place they didn't want to go. Why? God said he had given King Nebuchadnezzar rule over all the earth, over all the other kingdoms he had given him rule. He exiled them out of their own land to King Nebuchadnezzar to be, what? Saved. 
That's what he said to be saved. And then they became a burden upon the Lord. How? Because they went to Babylon and they began to prosper. Instead of being corrected, they began to prosper. That's what was written by the prophet Jeremiah. They became a burden unto the Lord. Acting, right? Now, what, what happens when you adopt the ways of the place you're in? You have characteristics like the daughter of that place. Did you know that they were once called the daughter of Babylon? Because of the ways they had adopted in Babylon. Let me continue in Revelation. And here is the mind that hath wisdom. There are seven heads, are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. The beast that was and is not is even he is the eighth, and is up the seven and goeth into perdition. Listen, and the ten horns which thou sawest. Oh, there we are. You see that? This is where people get lost. See, we were just talking about the mountains which are the seven heads of the beast. Five fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. Those were the mountains, which in the book of Daniel he called kingdoms, but those kingdoms were the rule of the earth, four distinct rules of the earth. And in that, under that rule, were what we call kingdoms. I'm showing you the language here. Why this word kingdom has to be used in its context, where it's going to mean something different where you read it from. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, Revelation 9. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, even he must continue a short space. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are the ten kings, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Listen, with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Let's keep listening. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are the peoples and the multitudes and the nations and tongues and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast. These shall hate the whore. They're going to hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Listen, for God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is the great city that reigneth over the kings of the earth. The great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. There's only one place God ever called the great city because there is no other great city in God's eyes. And there's only one kingdom that can ever rule over the earth. That's why it was usurped in Revelation. It was taken in Revelation. That was also established in prophecy. It gets confusing because the word Babylon is stamped on a forehead. And that's called a whore's forehead. That's what it's called. When something was stamped on the forehead of a person, a city um, emblem was stamped on a forehead. That was a whore's forehead and her domain was stamped there so everybody knew who she was they had jewelry and tinctures and all that other stuff that would mark them this is a representation of somebody the mother of harlots a mother means first the one who gave birth to all the rest so it had to be the first harlot a mother is the first of the daughters and if it's the first harlot she was also the first one to commit fornication and if she committed fornication and had many lovers right she's the mother of harlots that means at some point she was not a harlot because no one is born a harlot. You must become that. That's why the word harlot is used. You become a harlot. You're not born a harlot. Do you see that? You're not born one. You become one. You become one when you get away, start doing things you're not supposed to do, which means if you become a harlot, you weren't always a harlot. You were something else. The beast, by the way, can't stand this harlot. See the contradiction? A lot of people think this harlot, they said, well, the harlot's America. There's only one problem with that. America's brand new. America's young. America's not the mother of harlots. It's too young. You have to go back into ancient times. Use the language of the living God. If God calls something the mother of something, it was the first. And if it was the first, we're talking about something that existed in ancient times. And America was not one of those places. The beast cannot stand this woman. The beast is Satan incarnate in the earth, and the beast cannot stand this woman. What place on earth does Satan hate the most? You know what throws people off? God is simply showing a condition of the place, that's all. 
It's just a condition, just like us, redeemed the righteousness of Christ. But to look upon us, we're sinners, aren't we? We're sinners. Our current state right now, people trapped in the flesh full of sin with the blood of the Lamb washing over us. That's not what we're going to be. What we're going to be are the children of the living God joined heirs with Christ. You see that? That's what we're going to be. But right now, what are we? Right now, we're washed by the blood of the Lamb because we accepted Christ. Before we accepted Christ, what were we? Children of wrath, the Bible says. We were children of wrath. See, if I were to call any of you and say, you used to be a child of wrath, you still know I wasn't. But in the Bible, before you accepted Christ, Jesus called you children of wrath. He said you were once children of wrath. You were brought into the marvelous light. That means you're called. Then you're washed by the blood, cleansed. But at that point, your sinner saved by grace. Should you continue in that walk and continue to press on, you'll be fully delivered and have the victory over all. And then you'll be what? Join heirs with Christ, sons and sons of the Most High. To as many as believe upon his name has he given power to become sons of God. You see how that works? So in Revelation, it's not saying Israel is Babylon. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying that Israel is in a fallen condition. That's what it's saying. Can you see that? God does not listen. What is the fallen condition of a place? It's called the old man. In this case, the woman. How about that? God is not going to redeem the old man of us. We're to die to our flesh daily. The old man is supposed to be buried. Every single one of you, you have an old man attached to you. That old man is what you used to be. And if it's buried, that means it still exists, but it's not walking today. You see that? God is simply showing us a state of his own land right now. Right now, he's showing us a state of it. And see, this is why it's confusing. Why in the world would God allow the trampling of Jerusalem underfoot for 40 and two months? For the purpose of the indignation. All of this harlotry that's been in Israel, and if you don't believe God would ever say that she was full of harlotry, read Jeremiah chapter 4. Let me read that to you real quick. Can I read that to you real quick? Chapter 4. If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. Then you won't be removed. You won't be exiled. Nothing will happen to you. And it says, And thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. Did you hear that? If Israel would have returned at that time. Listen, that means if they would have gotten it right with the living God at that time, God would have healed the entire earth. Because what happened? They did not. And something happened to the earth. See, through Israel, if Israel were to turn back to the living God at that time, the earth would have been healed. But Israel did not turn back to the living God in that time. And the world was not healed. It suffered even more. What does that mean? That means by way of Israel, this earth could have been very different. And if earth can be different because of one entity, then that entity is doing what? Ruling and reigning over her. Do you see that? Just like God put you in a specific land. And he said, if my people who are called by my name, if they would turn from their wicked ways, turn back to the living God, then he would hear from heaven and do what? Heal the land. So who's the ruler or who reigns over your respective countries? The believers of Christ do, not the leadership. Not even the people, but the believers in Christ do. If the believers in Christ would humble themselves, if they would turn back to the living God and pray, then God would hear from heaven, and whatever land they're in, he would heal that land. But they have to do that collectively. So collectively, you rule and reign over the nation you're in, because you determine if it rises, if it falls, or to be more biblically accurate, if it's maimed or if it's healed. Through you, God would heal the land. He promised no other way to heal a land than through his children, through his own people. Do you know that? And haven't you seen the relationship between the iniquity of people? And when God's children become weak at heart, then the lands suffer because evil rises. And when evil rises, things tear themselves to pieces. The people have no chance. You rule and reign spiritually over the places you're in. And guess what happens when you're not praying? The principalities and powers and wickedness and spiritual, those things are ruling all over the place. When you stand up, they've got to back up. But if you don't stand up, then you're just giving them free reign over whatever country you're in. That's why 
In the Bible, it says that day shall not come unless it come a falling away first, and that matter of tradition be revealed. Those things cannot occupy where the Holy Spirit is, and wherever you are, the Holy Spirit is. You're the one that makes a difference. That's why things are degrading. More and more people are walking away. Do you know that? They're walking away from their faith. They're being swayed to do other things with other methods. Let me continue here. So, wait a minute. The Lord spoke all of this. And he told them to circumcise yourselves, said the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quench because of your evil doings. He kept telling them in the book of Jeremiah about your evil doings, and then he made a declaration. He said, my indignation, my indignation is against you, and it will not be quenched. It'll be fulfilled. He said, nothing will remove that. That's the trampling of Jerusalem for 40 and two months. That's, that's the trampling of that revelation. What would happen if you guys, in the next three and a half weeks, you saw a collection of nations run into Jerusalem and start slaughtering people? By the way, who would have a heart to slaughter people? Let me, let me give you an uh, eye-opener here. With this Russia-Ukraine situation, do you guys understand what's about to happen? Do you really understand where you're at? L let me tell you exactly where you're at. You can take it or leave it. The Ukraine is not going to stop bragging about its small victories. They're going to continue to publicly denounce Putin. They're going to do that. The USA is going to cross three red lines within a week. One will be crossed. Once the one is crossed, four days after that, another one will be crossed. Once that one is crossed, about one week later, another one will be crossed. That's three red lines will be crossed. Putin is going to be enraged. He is not enraged yet. Putin is not whistling Dixie. He can do exactly what he says he will do. If they continue to provoke, he's going to give the world a reminder. And that's going to happen very quick. See, because listen to me, what you saw on television of him taking out a couple of places and yes, civilians were hurt. Because that was a Navy, that was a naval operation from ships that were very far away. As soon as those guided munitions hit the land, the Ukrainian scuttle system will distort some of the navigation of those missiles. They won't tell that part. In other words, if you scramble the missiles, you make them go off target, they're still going to impact, but they go off target. They did intercept some. They did intercept some. The rest went off target. But when you send them off target, they're going to hit in places they shouldn't hit. I want you guys to understand that, first and foremost. Because if you understand this, you'll understand how it can provoke another country when you keep touting they're hitting places they shouldn't, right? That will make them angry especially when you involve children. I'm just telling you what I know. You start involving children, that's going to anger Putin big time. The U.S. is going to help out in their aerial defense. Israel is going to help in their aerial defense. They're going to do that immediately. Do you hear me? Immediately. So what does that mean? That means we're going to be heavily involved even more than what we are now. If Putin is provoked, there's not going to be one tactical missile launched at the Ukraine and that's it. That's not going to happen. Why? Because he understands reprisals. He understands the procedures. He knows exactly what the West will do. Because he can count on the West following their own procedures. Putin is a wild card. We don't know his procedures, but he knows our procedures. His newly appointed general, he really knows our procedures. He studied them for quite a while, and under him, the spots knots were over here training with our troops. Just in case you didn't know that, the general. That's over there right now. Some of the advisory boards that are over there right now with Putin, who are very loyal to Putin, were training with U.S. soldiers over here on U.S. soil and vice versa. So they're very well versed on the procedures of the West. So they know what the, US, what, what the West will likely do by way of standard operating procedures, which means Putin is not going to hit one place. He will have to cripple three to four nations should it escalate any further, because you know it's a stalemate. The Ukraine is never going to stop. NATO is never going to stop supplying the Ukraine. Russia is not going to back down. So what's the next step? Somebody has to make an example of somebody else. Somebody is going to have to tilt the world to establish dominance. This is a war of dominance. They made it into this big war, but I want you to note something throughout this entire time. Who's being empowered? Because in every single conflict like this, the little guy gets empowered and then the little guy turns. Now you mark my words. Every single time we keep arming the small country to defend against the big bad country, then the small country betrays everybody and does the unthinkable. If we arm the Ukraine, 
There are too many rogue elements in Ukraine that will not hesitate to utilize nuclear weapons. It may look good now because Zelensky is there speaking on behalf of Ukraine, but suppose something happens to Zelensky and he is no longer the leader with all that weaponry. You don't know what the loyalty is. We will have a centrally armed, a rogue set of folks with modern day weaponry. Can't you see what's happening? It's almost like people these days are not listening to reason. You don't taunt your enemy. When you're the little guy, you don't do that. That's prideful. That's just public stupidity. If you want your people saved, you don't want to fight for it. Because you know what weapons are. Weapons bring death. It really is time to negotiate. Somebody's not going to look good in the public eye, but people can live their lives, correct? You taunt your enemy, who is much bigger than you, and then you have other people do it with you. That's provocation. And you know what the Lord says? The Lord taught us something. He said, don't provoke your children to wrath. That's what he said. Don't provoke your children to wrath. You know, that's almost like saying when somebody is lesser than you, or if they can't quite catch on, you don't provoke them to wrath. You don't encourage them to fight you by your provocation. You don't do that. When you taunt your adversary, you're provoking them. I can tell you right now, knowing Putin and how he operates, can't you see that he made a declaration, right, of those four provinces that they were his. And when they did, when they did that to that bridge, did you notice well, they won't release the real count of missiles. They're saying that, you know, half were taken out. There weren't that many missiles launched. There honestly weren't. The targets, of course, the missiles go all over the place because of jamming that takes place in Ukraine. I hate it because civilians shouldn't have to pay the price for the stupidity of ambitious leadership. I understand the issue between democracy and communism also. But I also understand now that NATO is fully involved and Poland is involved and France is involved and, 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 you know, all these players are involved. The Ukraine is about to be armed with things they, you know, they're just going to tilt the scales. If those scales are tilted, Putin will respond with equal force. He's been doing that this entire time. Have you noticed they bought out a few pieces of equipment because it's KGB pride. That's what it is. KGB pride is to destroy your enemy with less than what they're fighting you with. Do you, do you know that? That's exactly what he's been doing. On purpose. But with the involvement of NATO, that's going to change. But I want you to keep your eye on something. We live in a time where the kingdom of the beast is going to rise. The kingdom of the beast will rise at a specific time and all elements of the beast will rise. Regardless of what you think is right, regardless of what you think is wrong, I want you to watch something. Because when one thing in the world starts going into the direction of darkness, all things will begin to go into the direction of darkness as part of the establishment of the kingdom everybody's been waiting for. Now, I believe that kingdom is already in place. It's just not yet been announced nor fully implemented in the world because you still have things your way. Right now, if they gave you rationing cards, which you'll probably get here soon, when you get the rationing cards, then this idea of the kingdom of the bees is not going to be so distant. When the identification devices come out, you'll need that because the skies will be full of drones. And if you're not identified, you could easily be eliminated, right? So essentially, to stay alive or to go outside and stay alive, whatever, you're going to have to be marked with some sort of technology that lets some of the drones know that you're not an enemy. That's what happen. These machines can easily distinguish you from an animal, but they have to know who you are. They have to know what nation you're from. So you'll have some sort of identification. I know they have a two governmental apps for your cell phones. One is part of the network, right? So if you're using Verizon, if you're using Sprint, if you're using something like that, you're already identified. There are a lot of people who do not use those networks. So if you understand this, I, you know, I had to say it that way, that you have to have some sort of identification because most people say, oh, well, I'm not getting a bracelet too bad. You already have a phone and you're utilizing services you didn't invent. And the identification for that phone is through those services. Your ident is going through that phone all the time. So wherever you go, wherever that phone is, you've been ID'd. And we're talking about by Aerocraft. That was implemented three years ago. Not one year ago, not this year, three years ago. And we're talking about a very special database. You guys remember the NSA, all that talk about the NSA, and then Edward Snowden went and fled the USA, and then all of a sudden all the trouble went with him. Remember WikiLeaks and all this stuff and how all that went away and nobody ever talked about it again. Oh, they did that beautifully because nobody ever talks about WikiLeaks. Nobody ever talks about Edward Snowden, who told people the truth. The only part he didn't tell you was that machines were responsible for absolutely IDing you perfectly. 
That's the only thing he didn't tell you. How that the average person cannot escape from their own personal mark, so to speak. Because everybody is going to use technology to stay engaged with their friends and family. It's not like you're just going to let your cell phone go or your computer go because you can't. You know, the one thing people are afraid of is not having a, a cellular phone is an EMP because they won't be able to use their devices. Did you know if an EMP actually hit, our defense net would fail in the same moment? But it would take more than an EMP to cause our defense net to fail. It would take much more than an EMP to knock out your cell phone. Do you know that we've had three CMEs that could not knock out the satellites that control your cell phones? You didn't know that, did you? They were supposed to. If these were, you know, older generation satellites, they would have been knocked out a couple of years ago. But they weren't. Some have taken some direct hits. Some have gone over safe temps and everything else. They're still working. Redundancy is very important. I'm just like, you know... EMP won't be the heart of your problem. Fuel will, because they're not going to release extra fuel to anybody. You'll have your money. I hate to keep saying this, but you're going to have your money. Product will become a problem. You'll have your money. You'll have your stuff. But your stuff may not have gas in it. Why do you think they're pushing so hard for electric cars? Do you understand the real issue behind fuel? They have enough fuel in the earth to get it out. The problem is getting it out. That's the part many people don't know about. They don't know what's stopping them from getting it out. The earth is not going to run out of petroleum. What pressures are building in some of the wells that used to be down there had to be sealed off quick, concrete. One of them, they, I believe they had concrete crews on site for three years. Every day they pump concrete down there. Yeah, we're going to have to repaint this old paradigm. Because, <laughs> uh, look, for the small part I know of for a fact, right? I do get irritated by this one thing. You ready? It's when God's children, good people, they don't have the facts on small things. And when you don't have the facts on small things, it makes you put a puzzle together a very weird way. That's why I continue to go over prophecy over and over and over again like that. I even get off subject sometimes, go back to prophecy. Why? Because you're at the gate of these things. You really are at the gate. You're at the door. You've already crossed. Yeah, in fact, you went through one door, went halfway, and you're halfway in the room at one. You're about to go into a brand new door. And this, when we go through this door, there's no going back. We can't go back. We can't. In other words, right now, we're at a place right now that, believe it or not, things could be reversed. But we only have a few more days before we go through another door. And then when we go through that door, the whole room that we came from is going gonna, is gonna to be gone. It won't exist. So there is no going back. That's the situation. I don't mean to make waves, but it really gets me because I understand how secrecy is, how propaganda is how counterintelligence is. And it really bothers me when some of you are missing very important pieces that you should have. And it takes, it, believe me, you just can't blurt certain things out. You can't do that. You know what would happen if I blurted out something really foolish and ignorant? I would blurt that word, and before it ever completed, I'd be off the air. And likely, you would never hear from me again. That's the truth. You know what the Lord says? Be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. You don't become prideful. You say, well, the Lord's protecting me. I can say anything I want because the Lord said, don't do that. You have to be somewhat strategic. Now, God will cover every area I'm not aware of, but I have to be responsible in those areas I know about. Because believe me when I tell you, they're just, you know, sometimes when you become a pinprick in somebody for a long time they just wait for the opportunity for you to get off your game a little bit and and that's that's always going to be there but i'm telling you the bible tells us everything the bible didn't miss a thing the problem with us is because in the word it says the word must be discerned spiritually and i really i really believe that sometimes we disregard that and we really shouldn't i personally believe that god has given you guys the truth but it's hard for you to believe the truth when you understand the ways of men. When you understand what your professor said. When you understand what you were taught in high school. When you understand, you have an understanding based on your experience only. That's very difficult to deal with because that's called reality. That's your reality here on earth. Your experience is reality, right? It's very difficult to compete with that. But the Lord will help us out. You may not know this, but even now we have a problem brewing. Right Now, if this problem breaks, and this is not a man-made problem, if this problem breaks, it's going to help quite a few of you out. It'll take the limitations off. You'll say, well, what that professor said doesn't work on this one. That means you'll consider the Word of God more, which means things will open up. Believe it or not, sometimes through our own academia, we can have chains on us where we can't believe anything else. We can't really see clearly at the time you're in right now. What did God say in the Bible about the end days? about how you see. What did he say? He said that you would see. That's what he said. In fact, he said you would see. You would see. He kept using that term. You will see this. 
you will see that. You will know this, and you will know that. You will hear this, and you will hear that. Doesn't he say that in prophecy? What does that mean? You're going to have a full awareness. You're going to have comprehension. But you must know portions of the word to apply it. You're going to hear it. You're going to hear those things God said you will hear. You're going to see those things God said you will see. You're going to experience those things God said you will experience. You're going to face those things he said you will face. All too often, only when reality breaks down will one consider reality is not the answer to all things. So that means portions of reality must break in front of your faces so that you will understand portions of the spiritual realm that are causing you limitations. God knows how we're raised and what it's going to take for us to fully open up and have used that full measure of faith. He knows he's going to have to break a perception and trust in this reality. That means you're going to be presented with things you cannot explain. That's not for you to go and print an article about it. That's not what that's for. In fact, if you were to see something really odd and strange, don't go spreading it all over the place. Consider the Word of God. That was for you. It wasn't for everybody. Everybody will eventually see what is needed for them to see, a truth for them to know, to open up their eyes spiritually. Because no saint of God was in Revelation blind. Revelation does not talk about any blind saints in Revelation. Did you notice that? That means you'll be able to see. Remember something, Israel has a state of mind God induced in the first place. Have you looked in Revelation and you see two things? You see Babylon talked about right after that. You only see mystery Babylon stamped on the head of what the Bible calls a whore or harlot, meaning she had something first but is now with something else. That means she's out of the way. That's what that means. But it's stamped on her head. It does not mean she is Babylon. Because what does the Bible say about Israel? God after they trample Israel underfoot. Remember this too. God will look down upon his land. He, he said this in Joel. He's going to look down upon his land. He's going to remember his land and pity the people. At that time, Jerusalem becomes a cup of trembling, right? That's also in another place. In the I'm putting it all together because they all say the same thing. So they attack Israel. They take Jerusalem. All of a sudden, all those who came against Jerusalem, God comes against them. It's almost like Jerusalem is used as an element to draw out darkness all over the earth. And whoever attacks Israel is going to be proven to have that heart of darkness of which God will go against himself. Then she'll be restored fully and no one will ever touch her again. That's how that works. So I, I say that because you have a lot of people in the world. And the very first thing they say is, yep, see, the Jews, they should not ever say that word. You know, if a person cannot use them in a biblical context, and that is God's people, no matter what state they're in. They've been in worse states, still God's people. When they were in Egypt, when they were in high rebellion, being exiled into Babylon, it's still God's people. God cares about his people. And in fact, he is distributing the power of the holy people all over the earth. And he comes back when that is complete. That's still God's people. We are grafted into the branch. They suffer a blindness induced by the living God. That's what the Bible teaches. God temporarily blinded them that the word of God will go out to the whole earth. Once that is accomplished, then people will start to go against Israel. And when that takes place, all those who went against Israel will fall miserably. They are the ones who will see the wrath of God. That's when the wrath of God comes against those who went against Israel. See, there's also a mystery behind that thousand-year reign. Because in that thousand year reign, there's peace on the earth for a thousand years when Satan is bound. After that thousand years is complete, Satan is let loose. And all those who were on the earth who enjoyed that peace, if they be evil, Satan deceives them again. But this time, they set themselves and their whole might to going against the living God right there in the Holy Land. So even after seeing the spiritual things in their respective realms, their hearts are still on Satan's side and then judgment falls forever upon them. I said, well, can't you see what's happening? God does this every single time. He'll utilize his righteous ones in the earth to identify who's really dark and who's not. Isn't that something? All the time he does this, all the time. Because if darkness was ever prejudged, just like a murderer, if, a, if somebody went to Hitler when Hitler was age 10, Hitler would say, I would never do that, but he did. See, at the end of the matter, the truth of us will always come out. At the end of the matter, not at the beginning, not in the middle, but at the end, the truth of us will come out. 
always, it always happens this way. And if you can remember that, I'm telling you right now, that, that one principle is universal for all things in the earth. I use that every single day. I never think of, a per, think of anything about a person in the beginning, in the middle, because I know at the end, that time of proving will come, and when that time comes, it will show me exactly who they are. Which is also why I never trust anybody, right? Let, let, let me qualify this. I can never say I really know someone until I've seen all sides of I have to know what your capabilities are. I know you. everybody has bad capabilities. I don't know who I'm working with unless I see the bad side, that raw side. So I have to see you do your breakdown first. And, and, and me, my, my value of a person is how they get up. That defines a person for me. I don't know a person just when they show me the good or two shoot side, because all of us can do that. But when you see that raw, broken down person, it's a different one. That's when you really know a person. When the name of Jesus means something to you, that means you really believe the story. You really believe he went through anguish and died just for you so then that name is almost like a monument like power within itself because it represents christ the only one the perfect sacrifice of first and many brethren right who died on the cross taking all sins upon himself the name means so much to me because of all i'm guilty of he took all the punishment upon himself of all of my purposed and unpurposed infractions and sin right? He took it all upon himself. He took my sins upon himself. He didn't just write it out. No, he paid the price. There's a difference. If somebody were to come up and say, Mike, your sins are wiped away. Have a good day. Okay. That's one thing. But when somebody takes your place and says, okay, you don't have to go to jail for the rest of your life. I'm going to go ahead and take your life sentence. What? That changes everything. If somebody was convicted of a murder, and uh, somebody came up and had words with the judge and they said, okay, you know, we're going to throw out this case. That's one thing. The person may smile and walk out, right? They'd be, oh, okay, oh, great. When a person comes up, and of course that wouldn't be permitted, but if they came up and said, I'm going to take your place. I'm going to go to jail for you. You go free. That would mess a person up. Can you imagine a person, if they, if they knew they were guilty of the crime, nobody wants to go to jail, but if they were guilty of the crime and somebody came up and said, I'm going to take your place, that would mess that person up. Having your set, having your, your, your case thrown out in court is one thing. Somebody taking your place is different because one of the first things you might say, no, no, you're not. No, you don't deserve. And suppose it was a good person who came up and took the place of a murderer in jail. That murderer would likely say, no, no, you're not doing that. Do you know why? Because it's a good person. A person who committed no sin, no error, no murder, no nothing. And yet they take on the punishment of those who committed the sin, the murder, or whatever the case is. That's very different. And see, to me, Christ took my place. I know me. And if you're acquainted with yourself, you know yourself too. You know exactly what you've done. I know what I've done. For Jesus to take my place. It's almost like this uh, hole forms within you that the flesh can hardly bear. Because the first question you have is, why would you do that? Don't do that for me. To this, to this very day, there's no way I could watch a movie where Jesus was being crucified. Because it, it brings it up like, like I went through some trauma. Because that is traumatic to me. And because it's so traumatic, there's no way I would use his name for an empty reason. Because that name means everything. You see the difference? That means I believe what the name stands for. I believe the person behind the name, the act that he did, and I'm well acquainted with his sacrifice. Not just to say he wiped away my sin, smile, and go on. No, he took my place. And when you're thinking about that, well, I'll tell you something else that happened, because the more you think about that, that problem, that this issue, this sin in your life that you can't quite get beyond, that's when you find the strength, because I'll tell you that when you really give this thought, it's going to do something to your heart, your desire to continue as you want to continue will cease. It will cease when you give that serious consideration. Those desires that you've been praying to get rid of, they're going to go. They cannot stay. The brokenness of your heart for that act in truth. There's no darkness that can stay in a place like that. That's when you really believe. You really believe when you really know that story. You're well acquainted with yourself. And to know that Jesus took your place, not just simply wiping it out, but he took your place. He satisfied the sentence that was against you. That changes everything, does it not? See, most people are taught that your sins are wiped away, yes. But they go no deeper. The depth of that is Jesus took your place. 
He served your sentence in full. If he paid the price, you better believe it was a price indeed. And the Bible teaches us that you're bought with a price, and that was a very high price. That cost him everything. And when you think of that upon yourselves, you really reflect upon your life, and you give yourself no excuses for what you did. You're just simply honest. It's heartbreaking. You're thankful, but you're broken at the same time. When you believe like that, that's when you start gaining strength to overcome much darkness. All the influence in the world, there's nothing in the world that can compare, nor can overcome the heart of someone who considers that and truly accepts that. And to believe upon that name is to know that story. That's when that name has great meaning. That's when that name is no longer spoken as a punchline. That's when no jokes are said about it. But when you mention that name, everything in existence around you hears it. That's when you stop speaking it as a word and it exits your mouth as power. That's when your authority is recognized within you and everything in the spiritual realm knows exactly who you are. That's absolute acceptance. You're having night terrors? Then think about that and just simply watch what happens by your sheer acceptance. When I gave it serious consideration, really thought about that, do you know what happened? The whole nature of everything changed within me. The impossible became possible. We're not talking about some supernatural thing except certain desires that I thought would never leave. They couldn't stay. Certain influences could no longer even be around me. Situations, not one was stagnant. But it's so easy to forget people, right? It's so easy to forget. It's so easy not to remember that. Most of you know this. But let me ask you this, when's the last time you sat down and really considered that? Do you see what I'm saying? We know there are gaps of time in our thoughts, and sometimes we will naturally think, hey, I already understand that, no need for me to give it thought. Well, you just simply don't think about it until someone evokes it, like tonight. And then you think about that again. That's when the nature of your prayers, they change. I was healed when I thought of that. I was. I didn't even ask for it. I was healed. I didn't even recognize I was healed. Until about five or six days later, I was healed because at that moment, to even think that Christ paid the price for me is a, is a pretty deep thought. You know, people can minimize that all they want. It's a very deep thought. And when Christ paid the price for me, in my own mind and in my heart, I said, how do I deserve healing? When he endured so much more for all of what I've done. And it caused me to think about my life. Listen to me. When I thought about my life, I was so thankful. The more I thought about my life, the more praise that came. The, I was just highly thankful for Christ. You know how sometimes you're not really thankful about anything. You just want out of the problem. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Sometimes you try to be thankful. But sometimes your heart is so shredded. You can't even get in that place where you're truly thankful about anything. You love the Lord. You just want your problem to end. Listen to me. Give it thought of what Christ actually did for you. Give it thought that he took your place. That eternity you would have spent away from the Father, that's been satisfied through Christ. We don't know what he did. We don't know what he did for each of us. I said, you know what? I proposed something one time because we don't know. I said, what if for each one of us, he did spend an eternity in hell for each one of us. We perceive time here in a very strange way. There is no time in the spiritual realm, so then one second could be a thousand years. We did, you know, that one day is a thousand years, a thousand years as a day was a phrase is almost realized as there is no time in the spiritual realm. Suppose Christ spent an eternity for each one of us in hell. Suppose that at the cross, instead of those stripes, being for one person, he felt the weight of billions upon billions upon billions, and he endured it. Sometimes we do think two-dimensionally, don't we? If the Bible says he paid the price, he didn't take a shortcut, did he? Jesus never took shortcuts. If he gave us the fullness of his truth, I suspect he paid the fullness of that price. He satisfied the first truth and the first judgment, and he took that upon himself, taking our place so that we could live. You don't know how long Christ suffered for you. I don't know how long he suffered for me, but I suspect that eternity is just a word and we have no idea of the depth of his suffering for each of us. Knowing he never sinned. The Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are, but without sin. Knowing that, it kind of steals the appetite away from all sin, doesn't it? 
And there are places in the Bible where a person has the Holy Spirit and they go out and commit an infraction and they can't commit to crucifying Christ again. That means because they have tasted of the powers of the world to come, partakers of the heavenly gift, they know exactly how long Christ has suffered. And they, it's so bad, they can't even crucify him again. Listen to me. They can't put him through that process again, so they just give up the ghost. When you read in the Bible again about those who had the Holy Spirit like Ananias and Sapphira and they died because of they tried to hold back some 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 uh, something from the Holy Ghost and they defrauded the Holy Spirit they gave up the ghost God didn't kill them they couldn't commit to crucifying Christ again for the sake of that new sin and so they gave up the ghost so they had intimate knowledge of his sufferings just imagine something if you had that insight this comes by way of the Holy Spirit when you have that insight how could you go out and sin again no way that Christ will go through that over again just for that sin you committed to pay the price in full for that. They had such intimate knowledge. It broke them right then and there and they gave up the ghost. That means they gave up their spirit of life and in that moment they died. That's insight. That means he suffered a great suffering and no one could ever see Christ suffer like that again for the sakes of their sin and that's why it hurts. When you think about Jesus paying the price for your sins, that's why it hurt me when I thought about him paying the price for my sins. Because I'll be honest with you, when it first hit me, I said, no, not for me. Anybody else, not for me. Don't do that for me. But it was too late. I was so broken. That's exactly what I said. Not for me. But he already did it. And any darkness that was around me, I walked right through it. Because see, at that moment, nothing outweighed the gift of salvation that was given to me through the sufferings of Christ and the price he paid. Do you see that? Nothing outweighed that. Right now, even in my worst moments, there's a high things in my heart for true things. I don't have to give myself a pep rally to be thankful. I'm eternally grateful. I'm always grateful, always thankful, because that thought is always with me. 